Thank you, Ian. And uh, let me thank John and all of the staff of Deep UK for pulling this meeting together. It's been a terrific, uh, yesterday was fantastic, and today is, um, we're halfway through another terrific uh, opportunity to get together. So I'm going to, uh, uh, to speak about translational big data, big data dementia science. And really there are just two messages. The first is that we've reached, we have begun to reach a stage uh, where we can de-risk the discovery and development of uh, new therapeutics uh, for dementia in very important ways uh, using uh, big data. By de-risking them, I hope we can accelerate the path towards finding new treatments, which is what we all seek. But the second message is that this is uh, the result of partnerships, and it's by working together across the whole range of stakeholders uh, that we have achieved what we've achieved and that we will achieve what we can achieve. So let me just remind you, I, I know this audience perhaps uh, doesn't need to be reminded except I just want to add to the sense of urgency that we all should feel. Alzheimer's disease is a major and it's a growing challenge as populations age. So in the UK, uh, the, uh, uh, the data suggests one new case every three minutes. So just reflect on how many new cases there have been while we've been talking about how to develop new treatments. Um, the numbers are rising so fast, and unfortunately, they're rising um, uh, faster in many countries within uh, the less uh, developed uh, parts of the world uh, where the burden is going to be greater on societies already straining with health care. We need to do something uh, urgently. Now in order to do this, we, um, I've worked across many different areas related to dementia science from molecular to, uh, to uh, whole organism to population and I'm absolutely convinced that it's only by harnessing uh, resources across biological scales, across the dynamic scales of time, uh, fast time uh, as uh, cells, as molecules and cells may experience, slow time uh, as, um, uh, as populations uh, and societies and people uh, experience, and across spatial scales, going from what's happening in molecule to molecule interactions to what's happening within a cell, between cells, between organ systems, and between um, uh, humans in, in our societies. It's only by integrating that information effectively that we're going to begin to understand uh, both the mechanisms, uh, well, the, the mechanisms, uh, their impact uh, on biology, the impact of that biology on the organism and the way in which that plays through to behavior. Uh, that is intrinsically a very large data problem. But because we can work together and aggregate our information increasingly in near real time, that becomes a big data problem. Now, Ian tried to, uh, uh, Ian provided one set of definitions um, uh, for big data. It's a challenging, it's a, it's a poorly defined concept. Uh, but the one that I like is just very simple. Big data is about the three V's. It's about volumes of data, about the variety of data coming from many different um, uh, sources, as I just described, and it's about velocity of aggregation. And that's really key. Big data is not only large data, but it's large data that's growing at enormously and increasingly, in the case of healthcare data, fast rates. Out of this, um, patterns uh, which Ian again referred to need not be immediately apparent, but with careful approaches to analyses, um, uh, both hypothesis-led and uh, without and, and in non-unbiased ways can lead to patterns emerging. Emergent patterns is another characteristic of big data and one that uh, we are finding ways of harnessing again and again. What I'm going to do is just lead you through a few um, relatively recent 
necessarily highly selective uh, examples of the way in which big data is, is uh, providing us opportunities to increase confidence in decision making um, in uh, the various stages of therapeutics development. There is no possibility that this is going to be comprehensive. What I've tried to do is focus on some relatively recent reports that uh, some and maybe many of you uh, aren't familiar with to talk about how we can use big data to better characterize disease target relationships so we can look from a target or potential target to what the impact of that target might be on, an, on people. And that's, of course, ultimately one of the key issues in selecting and prioritizing targets for therapeutics development. I'll talk a little bit, uh, although it's a much, much bigger topic, about how one can begin to minimize the risks uh, in, uh, in pharmaceuticals development or therapeutic development using uh, big data. Um, uh, the risks that certainly account for about 25% of the attrition of, of, of molecules once they enter development. We can anticipate that better, um, uh, make wiser choices at the point of candidate selection. Uh, we may be able to, in the end, ex use our resources much more effectively. Finding the right patient, uh, identifying disease when it is modifiable, uh, that is early, something we heard a lot about this morning. It's a terribly important topic. I'm going to touch on a couple of um, uh, uh, interesting recent observations in this area. And finally, there are many, many ways in which we can enhance the value of medicines, uh, enhance the value of all interventions using uh, big data approaches and I'll touch on uh, some of these, which will continue to grow. But throughout, I'm going to be emphasizing, if I, I won't mention this for, any, uh, for all of them, but every one of these examples that I'm choosing has been possible only because of uh, uh, the involvement of multiple stakeholders and, their app and, and using them to make a difference in the way we deliver uh, medicines to patients will only come through very strong industry academic partnerships, such as this is so fantastic to see here today. So let's talk about characterizing disease target relationships. So I'm very interested in focusing on and trying to focus on modifiable risk um, as a source of identification of molecules. But in doing so, I want to focus on causal uh, modifiable risks, because when we look at lots of associations, and you can see in this, in this um, uh, snake that was um, uh, published in Lancet, showing a full range, uh, well, a broad range of risk factors associated with increased risks of dementia, um, it is absolutely apparent that uh, we have to take this uh, very thoughtfully forward in trying to develop therapeutics because not all associations are causal. So, for example, here we have one man noting uh, everybody who went to the moon has eaten chicken. Um, and then the second man says, good grief, making the wrong inference, of course. Chicken makes you go to the moon. Now, we got to avoid that there are some important tools, and I just want to, to mention one that those of you who are not working actively in the field uh, might hear about but not, not really understand uh, very well. It's one of the most powerful tools that we have now in big data generally. It's a way of doing in silico clinical trials. Of course, what we want to do with a clinical trial um, is, at least a randomized clinical trial, is take people with certain characteristics but randomize them in, in our selection into our treatment, our expo or treatment or drug exposure and our placebo group. Now we can do the same thing using uh, the random allocation of alleles that occurs uh, in, in development. Mendelian randomization relies on this critical, uh, the, the uh, uh, the critically independent gene assortment in development. Uh, and by doing so, we have a, a randomization model that can mimic um, in silico what we would do in a trial. Then we can look at the effect of a variant 
that might affect a, a target gene and use that as, as a, a genetic tool or instrument uh, as a, uh, for our exposure. So if we have an exposure, we can look at the gene associated with it or genes and uh, get a genetic instrument for an exposure. We can have a genetic instrument for the disease of interest through our understanding of the genetic architecture of that disease. And then we can uh, look for their relationship. So we can look for SNPs that are associated. Um, uh, uh, we, can, we can look for the, the overlap of SNPs that are associated with them. In the context of individual molecules, uh, for example, drugs, we can use SNPs uh, that are an EQTL, or, or that is to say, that are close to and influence the expression of the target of, of, the, uh, of the drug, modulating it either up or down as these genetic instruments. And by virtue of this relationship between uh, ge the uh, genetic uh, predisposition uh, or the, and the genetic exposure variation, we can understand um, uh, their relationship uh, causally or putatively causally. So here's an example. We can test for causal relationships between common risk factors in dementia. So high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, all significantly associated with dementia. Um, and in one large study, um, the relationship um, is with blood pressure is described uh, on the left. Then what one can do is begin to use uh, genetic instruments for blood pressure, uh, those genes that are associated with uh, high blood pressure, genetic instruments for cholesterol, um, those that are associated with high LDL cholesterol, and uh, diabetes in this case through the surrogate of hemoglobin A1C, and then apply Mendelian randomization tools in the context of um, uh, Alzheimer's disease in this case to look for the uh, the potential causal relationship between any one of these risk factors and uh, the disease itself. And in this case, using in this particular study, of course, like it's limited by power, uh, the one of the three that showed clear evidence for potentially causal relationship is systolic blood pressure. That helps us prioritize those three risk factors for the one that is most likely to have a causal relationship to the underlying disease. Now, there's a huge, um, a second uh, problem that is, um, is facing us all is how can, you know, given the very long road to development of new therapeutics, can we reach into the existing armamentarium and repurpose drugs in current use for other indications uh, uh, for, the, for Alzheimer's disease. If we find a risk uh, uh, relationship that is causal, uh, for example, blood pressure, um, uh, which I'll come back to in, in a moment, uh, or uh, diabetes, can we reach into the armamentarium for those diseases, pull out a drug in common use, and actually repurpose it for Alzheimer's disease? One approach is to run a trial. Those are expensive. Uh, long. The other approach is to start by using uh, a genetic um, uh, proxy for metformin, in this case, which is a drug used to treat diabetes, and um, look for the relationship uh, between this uh, and um, uh, dementia. Using typical association uh, approaches, where we simply look to see if use of metformin is, or, uh, is, is associated with a decreased risk of dementia in a population. We can reach into very large databases. In this case, this was done uh, with an, a US database of about six and a half million, uh, which you see on the left, then replicated uh, in the C uh, CPDR database in this country with 17 million people. One can see consistent directions of effect uh, showing that metformin shows an effect on the incidence of uh, dementia not seen with siphonal ure ureas, suggesting that there may be a, a target-specific effect. And then if one goes in and uh, to the data more deeply, setting up a model that corrects for another, uh, another uh, association of metformin, which is that metformin also is associated with longevity in those populations. 
uh, and longevity itself is associated with higher risks of dementia. If one corrects the two out, one sees looking at the curve for uh, death rates and the curve uh, for uh, dementia incidents um, that uh, the dementia incidence still corrected for death rates um, is uh, in this population, in these two populations of almost uh, 7 million and uh, 17 million, shows an increased uh, an advantage for metformin uh, over uh, sulfonylureas uh, and um, in, uh, uh, in preventing uh, 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 dementia in the populations. So this gives us strong evidence um, in silico uh, that metformin um, may be acting through a target uh, that influences the disease risk. We can look further to uh, try to take uh, uh, using methods um, uh, that are more directly based on Mendelian randomization here in the context um, of small vessel disease. So first, if we look at the relationship um, uh, between uh, the causal relationships using Mendelian randomization between high blood pressure and a variety of stroke syndromes, and you might focus on the small vessel stroke halfway through, one can see that not only is there an association between high blood pressure and small vessel disease, but at least as far as the genetic tools allow one to explore, uh, there's that relationship seems to be causal as well. So then one can ask, if I modulate um, the, uh, this, the, uh, uh, the blood pressure using an intervention, uh, either beta blockers or calcium ch channel uh, agents, um, does one show a decrease in risk that is uh, uh, associated with um, a decrease in the risk of small vessel disease? If we look down uh, on this table, uh, one exploring the causal impact of drug exposures uh, assessed through genetic proxies of their targets uh, and stroke of different types. I'll focus again on small vessel stroke, which you see at the very bottom. You can see that there is a distinct difference between uh, the impact of beta blockers, uh, shown in gray, and uh, calcium channel blockers, shown in red, favoring calcium channel blockers, suggesting a specific uh, target-mediated um, uh, effect uh, on, the, uh, uh, on disease uh, development. Now, I often hear, <coughs> for, well, we, we hear from many people that the, uh, about how the, the experience, is how experience has shown us that the risks of development of new therapeutics uh, are lower for those therapeutics that are based on strong genetic, a strong genetic basis, which typically has been um, uh, uh, interpreted in the context of genetic association studies. If, if a drug is targeting a gene uh, associated with uh, a protein um, that is uh, found in a strong association with the disease, it's more likely uh, to succeed uh, uh, therapeutically than, than not, than one that is not. The challenge has been how do we expand the range of genetic data that's available given the relative insensitivity of GWAS studies and certainly uh, the lack of GWAS studies uh, for, for example, progression, uh, which in the case of, uh, of Alzheimer's is what we're mostly concerned with when we encounter it in the clinic. One interesting approach that's been presented uh, recently is to um, is to focus on using the druggable genome uh, as a tool. Uh, and here, uh, the druggable genome is um, it's a continually evolving concept, but it basically it involves uh, identification of those proteins, of genes associated with those proteins uh, for which there is a precedented approach uh, to pharmacological mod modulation. Uh, the, the database currently has 4,000, 4,500 uh, genes in it. One can then take uh, these genes and take uh, and, and use them uh, as a tool for 
uh, an association study with the disease of interest, and in this case, um, this was done with uh, Parkinson's disease, um, and look for the relationship between um, uh, uh, druggable uh, genes and the disease-associated genetic um, uh, risk. Each druggable gene can be associated with a, um, an, uh, an EQTL, uh, so that there is a, uh, it has a genetic instrument for, the, uh, for, for assessing through Mendelian randomization its causal, potential causal relationship to the disease. We know something about the disease genetic architecture, and the two together, just as I've described before, can be used to develop a target-by-target target, uh, Mendelian randomization study uh, uh, analysis, uh, which you see here at the bo uh, on the far right on the bottom, and this helps to prioritize genes that have a precedented uh, medicinal chemical approach to modulation uh, for their use in uh, in Parkinson's disease. It, this set of genes also. Um, extends the range of genes uh, beyond those that meet uh, strict uh, association criteria, uh, providing us a broader uh, uh, genetically supported uh, target set. Let me move on to a couple of comments about using big data to minimize risks for pharmacology. We've heard a lot about biomarkers today, and uh, much of what we've heard about biomarkers focused on protein biomarkers, clearly very important. But if we're trying to define protein biomarkers that are more likely uh, to become, uh, uh, to reach the strict criteria for becoming surrogate biomarkers, we want to ensure that those protein biomarkers are not only related to the pathology, but ideally that they also have a causal relationship to the pathology. I suspect you can all guess what I'm going to describe. Um, we can look at the, uh, in this case, uh, this is a study showing a really nice analysis of proteins expressed in the CSF um, uh, with, um, in, in this case, um, uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, looking at their, uh, showing that the uh, proteins that are, that are expressed highly in the CSF also are expressed highly in the brain, providing uh, some phase validity. But then again, by linking these proteins to um, their protein uh, uh, quantitative trait loci, uh, loci uh, we can uh, develop the kinds of instruments uh, that allow Mendelian randomization on the basis of their cis, QTL, and prioritize these proteins for those that are particularly causal. So here one can go across a number of, of different disorders, and one can see, for example, old friends like APOE popping up with AD, but also some that are uh, less, um, uh, less apparent uh, in the uh, uh, in the GWAS studies, such as MMP10, and in other diseases, uh, we began to see uh, those that are falling below uh, the um, the association study uh, cutoff line. That means that we can find biomarkers. We can prioritize our biomarker choice uh, for follow-up to those that are more likely uh, to be uh, most informative. But of course, adverse events are still causing uh, attrition in perhaps a quarter of molecules carried into clinical studies in general. The, I, this is a huge area, and I, I'm not going to develop this, but just provide um, you know, really a high-level uh, view of it. Uh, genetics is, uh, has reached the point where it can be used as a routine tool for rapid in silico um, uh, first line assessment of the potential risks associated with a molecule by, for example, looking for, uh, for uh, truncating mutations within the exome of uh, uh, in uh, protein encoding uh, sequences in the genome uh, so that one can identify people who are either heterozygote or homozygote for uh, loss of function of uh, any particular protein. In fact, the, uh, 
the frequency of these is remarkably high so that in uh, one can find, um, we can find the examples of these in all of us and over moderate sized populations one can find lots of examples uh, of any single uh, protein that one might uh, wish to, to uh, uh, interrogate. In populations, um, in a number of populations then one can look for the effect uh, uh, at least genetically expressed of inhibition of 50% or 100% of the function. And this is a really powerful tool for looking at the uh, off potential uh, off-target effects of, of the, um, uh, sorry, uh, looking for the effects outside of the organ system of particular interest. The second um, thing that one can begin to do is couple these genetic tools uh, with cell biological tools uh, to look for the, um, uh, and interrogating, for example, the cancer genome uh, in order to understand whether there are any, there's any association between a, a, a target of interest and driver mutations for, um, uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, oncologic transformation in order to uh, begin as a first line rather rapidly to mitigate risks for, for uh, tumor development and um, uh, finally begin to look uh, for genes associated with um, uh, cardiac, um, ap uh, cardiac arrhythmic uh, uh, complications. I won't say much about the next either, which is about finding the right patient. We've heard a lot about stratification uh, today, or, uh, but I did want to comment on identifying disease when it's modifiable. I think Sarah showed us a brilliant example of what's happened in Huntington's disease, where one has the advantage of being able to, to have, a, one has the advantage of a, of a fully penetrant uh, mutation uh, to understand uh, something about the primary determinant of risk. Um, but this is a particular challenge in the context of the late life neurodegenerative diseases without single Mendelian causes, because we know that these diseases are developing over uh, decades before uh, their clinical expression. And we also believe that if we can step in at the earliest stages, we're probably more likely to be able to treat them. Particularly, I'll point out, if we're guided by therapeutics that are themselves informed by genetic association studies of susceptibility to the disease. And this is from Bart de Strooper's review with Eric Karen some years ago. And what I really want to highlight from this is actually that the clinical phase, the point at which most of us might begin to see these people uh, in uh, an office, um, in an office visit, is a very tiny part of the disease. Uh, it's evolving long before then, and how can we begin to pick up the disease and most importantly, pick up the phenotype of the subclinical or early clinical expression of the disease to provide some indication for therapeutic intervention? Now this takes a particular kind of big data study, and I'll just highlight UK Biobank as an example, and perhaps the first really strong example of this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, study, in which one has a prospective longitudinal study through, uh, from uh, um, uh, an early midlife period or even a younger period through to death. I won't go through all of the details of UK Biobank except to note that by following people through decades of their lives, we can begin to pick out the re relationship between incident disease as it appears and the antecedent events and of course uh, the predisposing uh, causal elements. So for example, in UK Biobank, if we just look at focus on the l last two lines here, which are Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, in 2020, they were relatively small populations out of the 500,000 in the UK Biobank study. But by 2027, uh, we'll have three times uh, as many, and it will grow even more rapidly as points of inflection rise as these people age longer. 
The current um, mean age in UK Biobank for people uh, is um, uh, approaching 70, and there's a very broad tail. So we're at a phase now where many of the people who we are observing, a very large number of them, are going to develop Alzheimer's disease in the next um, three to five years. That's an extraordinary opportunity for us to begin to pick up the phenotypes. We can also relate these phenotypes to uh, multiple organ systems. We've talked about risks with other diseases. Uh, in fact, we can look very specifically at this. This is from a cardiac study that we've done uh, recently where we characterized cardiac function in many ways. And what was really surprising is an association signature came out in this phenome-wide association study uh, with cognitive phenotypes by going in and really characterizing the genetic architecture of cardiac trays. We can use these uh, in a variety uh, to flesh out the biology and then in uh, classical uh, e uh, ge genetic inference models such as I've described, we can look for genetic overlap and evidence that the same genes that may be driving cardiac phenotypes, particularly uh, in this case uh, for a vascular distensibility in the aorta, also can be associated with small vessel disease and dementia uh, in the brain. This link between large vessel and small vessel is something that is actually important but has been difficult for us to see before. So finally, I'm going to talk about enhancing the value of, of, um, uh, of what we do now. There are many ways by reaching into large data sets. In this case, this comes from UK Biobank again, where one reaches into the imaging data set. A small da a, a traditional approach would be to use the imaging outcomes. If one uses a big data approach and includes all of the raw data as well, people can go into these data sets and reanalyze them in new ways, deriving new types of, in, of, 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 of phenotypes uh, uh, for trays. This is a case from Carla Miller where she's reached into the UK Biobank data, reached but used raw imaging data, reconstructed quantitative susceptibility maps, uh, generated uh, which provide very fine-grained uh, quantitative maps of iron distribution in the brain, use this to look across the population at determinants of iron distribution in the brain, identify genes that are associated with this to begin to understand the relationship between iron deposition causally and um, uh, later neurodegenerative changes. The harmonization that can be uh, can, can within um, well-constructed um, large imaging data sets or other biomarker data sets can be used for serial observations. We heard something about that today. Here's uh, uh, you know, an example uh, which I, you know, I was very excited about during is one of the positive elements of the COVID uh, uh, period is that we had this opportunity to look at the uh, impact of this infection on the brain because one had, we had studied in UK Biomech a group of people just before the onset of the pandemic and then during the pandemic with very uh, well harmonized imaging, we could look for changes in the brain very sensitively, uh, controlling them because of the large number of people against for uh, looking at people who had SARS-CoV-2 exposure versus those who did not. So if you look at those who were exposed in red, they showed a loss of brain volume the loss of brain volume was greater with greater ages. If you looked at the control group that was unexposed, it was a post hoc data derived control group by matching for multiple variables. You could see that they did not. And then you could map exactly where the brain loss occurred. And it was in the orbital frontal regions, uh, areas uh, where there are transsynaptic connections with the olfactory tract. One can begin to understand what the phenotypes of preclinical disease are. This is a lovely study that um, uh, Cynthia Sander at Cardiff did recently. She noted that uh, there was accelerometer data in UK Biobank, in fact, and she said, well, how many people 
develop Parkinson's, which of the people that develop Parkinson's disease uh, within a seven year window after the accelerometer data was acquired and can I distinguish them on the basis of what they were doing seven years before the disease manifest itself. And what she discovered really quite remarkably in this accelerometer data, people were wearing smart watches throughout the day for a week. She looked at the hour by hour uh, change in the hour by hour acceleration phenomena in people with Parkinson's disease, who developed Parkinson's disease within a seven year window, shown in green, and those who did not but were otherwise matched for age, sex, and a, couple, and a couple of other variables in blue. She showed that there was a significant difference. You can see here, uh, looking um, uh, uh, across uh, uh, multiple uh, different incident diseases that this was relatively specific for Parkinson's disease, which you see in the middle. And this actually tells us that the, there was a phenotype that was subclinical expressed years before Parkinson's disease. And this is the sort of thing that we need in order to find a treatable uh, indication for, for early interventions. So, this, I think, is one of the hottest areas in big data, still needs to be developed. Um, we heard some exciting things today about remote sensing. <clears throat> We're going to hear much more from David Sharp very soon about how to turn this remote sensing into an ecosystem. And we can potentially look forward to a future where people at higher risk are monitored very closely, people in clinical trials might be monitored very closely, and we might have immediately or rapidly, uh, rapidly translatable clinically meaningful endpoints for powering new and faster studies. So I'm going to close now. I hope I've highlighted to you how we can use big data to characterize disease target relationships, minimize risks for pharmacology, find the right patient, identify disease when it's modifiable, and enhance, enhance value. There's much more to be, uh, to be done, uh, much more that is happening, but realizing the promise of big data for dementia research undoubtedly is going to demand close collaboration across academia, industry, government, and the wider society. That's what we're here for today, and it's so exciting to see this uh, evolving so well in this country. Clinical trials may still be a challenge, but this is one thing we're getting right. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Really, really nice illustrations of the convergence of really large data sets. We've got time for a few questions. Uh, if anyone wants to stick their hand up, I'll see if I can spot them. Don't be shy. Wow. Oh, I think it's the postprandial snooze. And I've contributed to it, obviously. <laughs> Certainly not. No questions? Yep, one there. Just get a microphone to you. Hello. My name is Rabi from Deep UK Wales. Um, so it, it was fantastic to see uh, how big data can contribute to the uh, whole stream of things that is happening. My question is um, um, maybe from uh, what, what I know in the neuroscience neuro, um, um, stream is uh, can we see a future that we use the big data to optimize the trial design so we talked about n equal to one. Can we um, use the big data to actually target the n that we recruit for the uh, trials and then uh, reach an optimized sample that we, we recruit really? Do you see that in coming in a very close future or uh, are we far away from that? Uh, no, I think we're very, I mean, we, are, we can do that now. And I think it's, it's actually remarkable that more hasn't been done to, to use that as a tool. Not necessarily for deciding what the best trial design is, but for, uh, for providing uh, an additional level of confidence in any trial design 
um, uh, or to potentially um, uh, reduce, reduce confidence in alternatives. And that's because you can, for example, trials that involve stratification of subjects prior to their onset. One can begin to take uh, some specific examples uh, in which one manufactures trial designs in silico and look at the behavior of different subpopulations. A very interesting observation in uh, stratification studies going back many years is, for example, the assumption that stratified populations show the same variance as the, whole, as the population at large, um, it's, it, 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 it in general doesn't hold. One can begin to test that in specific instances in this way and then use that to design a stratified trial with, um, uh, uh, to in best ensure that it has adequate power to determine the outcome of interest. That's just one example. But I think there's a lot more that could be done and, and clever statisticians such as yourself uh, you know, can contribute very much to how this is used. Well, thank you very much for a, a great talk and um, yeah, very much appreciated. Thanks.